We've all seen various forms of revival in the last 25 years. The 30s, the 40s, the 50s, even the 60s have been revived in various different ways. We've seen Ted's, Mods, Rockers, even Psychedelia make a comeback, sometimes more than once. But when a few weeks ago I started to hear that punk was reviving, I was very surprised because I didn't even know it was dead. In 1979, punk clubs as such had vanished and punk venues faded away almost in direct proportion to Adam Ant's rise to glamour as a teeny idol. But last month, without much warning, the tribe opened on Tuesday nights in Leicester Square. Here, if you like Mohican haircuts and bondage trousers, you can pogo to progressive punk groups like Blood and Roses. This is their first single, which came out last week. It's not just punk in, in a sort of 76 sense, it's punk in an 83 sense. Be part of it. Not negative, destroying, but, but act and create, be, feel optimistic and positive about the future. Well, we want people to see the band, not just come down because it's a club and just to doss around and pose, be looked at, be seen by other people, their dress and all that shit. Because I think that's, that's what happens in a lot of clubs today. You know, it's, Wim it's McDonald's entertainment in places like the Palace. And we want people to come down here be the club, that's what we really want, the people in it to be the club. Uh, it's more down to earth, don't get so many people posing around the place, a little more at ease here. You didn't have a chance to be in the original thing and this is your yeah, chance to... Yeah, I was to... about 12 years old at the time and in Italy you don't hear about these things until 10 years later, yeah. so, you know. Obviously their dress is different, their attitudes are slightly different and music taste is slightly different, but I think they've continued in the same way. To me, it's a welcome relief from the glossy nostalgia of Blitz Kids and new romantic glamour. All more the expression of a desperate fashion world than the explosion of the zeitgeist. Now sweaty old punk is back, and as in 1976, when the Sex Pistols became the ferret at the throat of that frightened rabbit, the music business, the reasons are chiefly boredom with the current scene. So um, the reason for, for the number of bands that are sort of coming out onto the scene is, uh, is a question of necessity, as well as the anger that they're feeling through the poverty and, and sort of being pissed off with their general situations. It's a kind of way out, isn't it? I mean, you yeah. feel, you know, I mean, well, my personal feeling is that, you know, it's the only thing I've got to be able to get me out of, of, of complete sort of lassitude and boredom. You know, it gives me an object, you know, an object to, to go for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily money and riches, but, you know, some kind of... Focus. Uh, yeah, so right. Yeah. Yeah. What musicians do you write? <laughs> I mean, who do you think is a good singer? I don't. <laughs> I don't have any heroes. <laughs> They're all useless. Well, there's no bands around, is there? None. None that are accessible. Well, before you... Unless pay you pay a fiver to see them, and then you can't see them. And what sort of people came to see you in the beginning? I don't know, just bored people. Bored out their brains with hippies. <laughs> What's this thing you've got against hippies? They're complacent. You were just attacking Top of the Pops and the sort of bands that are on there. What Do you think they're relevant to the kids 16, 17? Of course they're not. Relevant to their mums and dads, but that's about all. What about names like Rod Stewart? What about him? Mums and dads, yeah. He's all round, isn't he? All round entertainment. He's an old f***. 
what to do, it gets up there and starts like going on with this string orchestra, you know what I mean? It's not what you feel like. So you've got to have some music what you feel like. Otherwise you go balmy, don't you? I think their attitudes really stink. Now anyway, they just like there just has to be new groups, and then that's what you got. The Sex Pistols say they hate hippies, everything they stand for, and the hippies what are what went wrong with music. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's right. I think that's where the complexities came in, you know? When people thought, oh, we better buy our Moog synthesizer, or we'll get caught out, you know? Like, maybe... If there's any around, they should, like, you know, jump into action immediately. Because, you know, I suppose you ain't there for they've had too much dope. Yeah, lying on the floor and looking at the ceiling. But it's another generation to yours. Yeah, one that went wrong. Groups like the Sex Pistols and The Clash felt that what was going on then was nothing less than a revolution. Young people were rescuing pop music and taking it out of the hands of an older generation. As I said, you know, the kids took over and I was a kid then, I mean, I'm sort of... Pushing on a bit now, I suppose. I mean, in comparison with the kids are doing things now, if any are doing anything of any consequence. Um, yeah, it was just to say, like, I'm here, and this, you know, I'm going to go about things in my own way and not be dictated to by, you know, like the Rod Stewarts and people who, who like the pop moguls and stuff who aren't really in touch with what was going on. I mean, it was, it was a street kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Did you realise what you were starting then? Yeah, actually. When you got something good, you know that you got it. I mean, you, f you feel a confidence, like an inner confidence. People like John Savage, now a journalist, saw the Pistols as the expression of all their frustrations with music and politics and were inspired to self-expression. I, I felt so energised and so excited at the time that I wanted to do something myself. And the thing that I really wanted to do was write. I never wanted to be in a rock group. That was never a particularly viable option. And the only other thing to do at the, at the time was to write, a, and also I was interested in, in graphics and visuals. So um, I was working at the time, and in my lunch hours, and any time I could sneak away, I stuck together what was then called a fanzine, or either on the bog at work or in a pub or somewhere. And um, Xeroxed it at work, and eventually got it printed and produced that at the end of November 1976. Punk wasn't just a new brand of music, it seemed to offer revolution in every aspect of life. So it was, if you like, an explosion of the new. I mean, it happens in all sorts of ways at various different times. Um, this society, particularly at the moment, is all about um, you have a great pressure of weight to the establishment and institutions keeping forces that act for change down because we are in fact we are living in a time of extreme change very rapid change and that change isn't allowed to express itself and it was rather like a dam burst that enough water had built up over the last 10 years and then suddenly the dam burst and of course when a dam burst you get a lot of power in a very short space in, in, in a very concentrated space what, what do you think it achieved um, you know, the pistols. I think it made people talk and um, question things about music, you know, and art, music as an art form and, you know, the, the social significance of it, as opposed to it just being like some sort of nifty little tune, you know, that you kind of hum along to. I mean, if you get a record on the radio, you've got a perfect way of um, saying something. You know, you got all that exposure, and I mean, people pay sort of millions of pounds for like a party political broadcast or whatever, and like you've got a three minute single to, to say what you want to in it. And if it's got a good tune, people like, give it the time of day. In 1977, the punk revolution seemed to be in full swing. God Save the Queen got to number two in Jubilee Week and the Sex Pistols were internationally infamous. But within a year, the Pistols would split up and with them many people's hopes that punk would change things permanently. And of course, 
it never really happened. Mm. And that was the same in a different way with the Sex Pistols, because I remember Jamie Reid telling me that, that they all hoped, they all thought that they would just be the start. And what in fact happened is they were the only punk group, and most of the other ones that came out afterwards were, if not pathetic, then, then sort of fatally flawed. I mean, The Clash, after being initially wonderful, turned into a bunch of social workers. Very successful, very honourable social workers, but social workers nonetheless. And the, you know, the Damned and all the others were just sort of hyped up entertainment, really. Mm. No, I mean, I'm not putting them down for that, but it, it meant that the original thing was diluted. Um, and that sort of very pure expression of, of, of energy got diluted. Politics and punk, I, I don't really, didn't really take it seriously then. Um, I also think that many of the kids, quite frankly, they weren't taking it seriously. You had obviously many aware kids, and I mean politically aware, not sort of aware in generally, um, who obviously thought it was serious and they were going to change the world. But uh, all you do is shift it from one side to the other. And I think for a while they did actually shift it, maybe slightly to the left. And now it's gone back again. And now it's gone back again. We have a right-wing government, don't we? <laughs> Susie and the Banshees are one of the few punk groups not to give up or change their attack. This year, Susie got her own record label. An early Sex Pistols fan, her first appearance on stage was in 1976 at the first punk festival. Did you try to get a band together? Yeah, I did at the 100 Club, the punk festival. Susie and the Banshees. What did you sing? The Lord's Prayer via Twist and Shout, Knocking on Heaven's Door, and a bit of Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber Alley. And <laughs> what went down the first? All of it. It got boring in some parts, but it picked up. Are you a singer? Yeah. Had you sung before? Not on stage, no. Did you think that was important? Um, no. And who was backing you up? Sid Vicious on drums, Steve Spunker on bass. Marco on guitar, me just doing the vocals. Seven years later, in the Camden Lock shop run by our friend Morticia, I tried my hand at interviewing Susie and Steve. The, the only rubbish that there is is to get um, sucked into business and into thinking about shifting units and all that kind of uh, business talk, yeah. which... which Unfortunately, a lot, lot of people that are making music are thinking more about business than making music. Yeah. Or yeah, you simply have to tailor your business to fit your music rather than tailor your music to fit an industry that thinks it knows better because yeah. it doesn't, because yeah. it's full of idiots. Susie thinks the revolution failed because of media resistance. Well, it's down to there's too much power in the wrong places. Um, it's closed up so much within TV and radio. I mean, I mean, peak radio and TV. Mm. You know, and shove things on late at night. You know, because no no one's awake to watch it or something, yeah. or, or they're preaching to the converted yeah. anyway. Yeah. But there's just too much power with those kind of people. Yeah, and they decide what's. Uh... Yeah, well. yeah, I mean, you know, you make you make a video and there's only one program that it can go on and yet they censor, they say, we like it or we don't. Half the time, the effort that you've put into something to um, get across to more people, an idea, is not allowed to be shown or seen or heard. Yeah, yeah. Private sword, comes with that. Yeah. All belong to the Young Ornithology Society, they're various different public schools. But now, inspired mainly by Susie, punk's regaining momentum, taking up where the Sex Pistols left off. Sitting there in their teenage werewolf t-shirts and everything, talking about bloody prayer spotted tweeters, seen in the Norfolk fans and things. But they're trying to take 1983 punk in a new direction. Shut up! And the others don't hear them, they're going, it's nice to write greater spotted tweet. Where they differ from us is that we're doing things, but we're also trying to do things on... Uh, we're trying to change things yeah, as well I'm through through songs, through level writing level. as well, whereas they're not. They've done something and they've just merged into the sort of yeah. environment that they were totally against as yeah. punks. No way to 
But you, you're a problem child You set your mum on fire and you train your dead wild They put you in a care and you beat the kids up They put you in a ball stool and you strung yourself up This is Brigandage, the other group on tonight's Bill at the Tribe. Brigandage was started by lead singer Michelle, who continues to carry the old punk torch. Like many of the original punk groups, Brigandage was formed at art school. Following Susie's example, Michelle broke into a music world totally male controlled until punk stirred things up. She lives with friends Angie, Richard and Stumpy, the punk cat, in a West Hampstead anarchist squat. Their inspiration came from seeing the Sex Pistols in 1976, but were too young then to get involved. Sex Pistols were like a callus with anarchy in the UK, you know, when that came out, it was a, a real jar to the senses. I mean, anarchy in the UK, who'd, who'd, who'd sort of heard of any of this before, you know? I mean, the so word anarchy yeah, yeah, made yeah, us all go, I mean, oh, anarchy, let's look it up in the dictionary. I mean, it, 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 even, before anarchy, even before anarchy came out, I was sort of sitting at school, and I'd never heard of the sex, was, uh, sex pistols before, and somebody was reading a newspaper, and they were going, Christ, this group's sort of like fighting their own audience. And I sat there and thought, my God, a group beats up their own audience, <laughs> so just got to have something, you know, it just must be mad. Well, we were always different anyway. I mean, like, we dressed um, slightly different, more on the avant-garde disco scene, like pegs and plastic sandals before mm. punk came out. And I saw this girl, yeah. I might think must be Susie, at Charing Cross Station at really early 76, and she had a safety pin through her ear. I didn't even know what punk was, and I thought, brilliant idea, I mean, Christ. <laughs> so I rushed off home, got the safety pins in, so I was wearing safety pins before I even knew what punk was. Though their music remains central to 1983 punks, it isn't everything. Michelle, for instance, is also about to appear in a play. I can't hear myself. Chris has got this uh, little theatre where he hasn't even got a stage, but he's got like places for seats at the top of this pub in Mile End. He does punk plays for punks by punks. And, uh, well, I'll give him alone. I mean, they he tried. He, well, he's got sympathies that way. He's about 23. Is he? Yeah, he's in the age. And uh, he writes some really good stuff. I mean, he's a writer, so um, Time Out said he was a, he got a brilliant review in The Times, of all places, so it was really good nitty-gritty dialogue and everything, and uh, really perceptive and everything like that. And Time Out didn't think it was uh, true to life enough because the punks were too articulate. <laughs> I'm sorry, we weren't quite working class and yobby enough. Not quite stupid Not enough, Not quite yeah. stomo enough for Time Out. I mean, you know <laughs> how they like to stereotype their uh, things. Style is its own statement, of course. Nowadays, the early raw look has given way to a more painstakingly cultivated dandyism. Oh, a way of life it is, in your clothes and your hair and... Yeah, your attitudes right. and everything, but for a lot of people, that's the only way they do ever get to express themselves. Because yes. it's so short, I can't really do the roots. So I'm always forever just doing the ends, and I just get more and more like glue. Have you ever over bleached hair or done a home perm, and it goes like glue, like copy dicks? But the differences between 1976 and 1983 go a lot deeper than fashion. Outraging the public or even gobbing are now as boring as a Top of the Pops disco hit. Organised politics are out, blood and roses. Uh, we're interested in the politics of the individual, whereas the individual has the right to do whatever the individual wants, whatever the individual needs to do to make their life happy without the silly restrictions that a government feels obliged to put on people. Well, there's more than just anger. Anger's an emotion that's just been done to death over the past five years. There's more emotions than that, there's more scope of feeling. There has, to be, there has to be more than just anger. Like, yeah, you feel anger for your governments, you feel anger for, against them. But then you've got to also be able to experience all the other things. You know, like, anger is too much of a limiting emotion. It takes over everything. Yeah, sure, we're angry about governments, all that kind of things, but there are other emotions that need to be expressed as well. And people have got to learn to sort of express themselves more freely instead of just 
putting on up shields, you know, that, that they've been conditioned to have. In their non-violent antagonism towards established politics and determination to change themselves before tackling the world, positive punks remind me a bit of 1960s hippies, though more realistic, less mystically drug-based. The music and energy of 1976 has combined with 1967's idealism. It's a fresh angle of attack on the awfulness of 1980s Britain. Style, music, tactics, the modern punk idiom isn't a media fad. It's, in my opinion, nothing less than a moral attitude. That now we're sort of realising that we don't we don't want to settle down, we don't want to change that much, and it's not a cult to us anymore. It is sort of like a lifestyle. It's like Mum used to say, "Oh, she'd grow out of it at like 16, yeah. and I'm 23 yeah. now." Yeah. I mean, yeah. she's yeah. just accepting it yeah. now. Yeah. Just. And if you want to compare it to '76, what well, the whole attitude is to keep on thinking, do anything you want to do. If you want to be a street sweeper, be a street sweeper. You know, don't moan about things. Don't moan about unemployment. Don't moan about politics. You can't change it. Moaning about it's not going to change it. If you're going to get free money off the government, use your time to do whatever you want to do with it. I just said the most important thing is to be an individual and not a part of any sort of any group that you can be labelled easily. You know, just just be yourself, basically. Yeah. Just be you. Well, this destroy, destroy thing before, destroyed society. I think people now accept that society exists and, and, the, and that just by being in a band isn't going to change the world. So, punk hasn't been revived after all, but it has changed. And it's become something of a synthesis, I feel, between the, the, the sort of optimism and, and uh, political ideals of the 60s underground that I remember and all that started in 1976. Whether it keeps that momentum and makes any real changes, I think, remains to be seen. Personally, I remain very optimistic. And optimism's what it's all about, really, isn't it?